Yep. I want to ask you a question this morning. How big is your view of God? How big is your view of God? You know, in the ancient Greek world, they had a very small view of God or, let's say, their gods. For example, they had a god called Zeus, and he was known to be the chief of the gods. And they would say that he was powerful, but you know what? He wasn't all powerful. They would say that Zeus had authority, but he was not all authoritative. You see, Zeus had other gods serving underneath him, but you know what? Sometimes those other gods, if you read the Greek mythology, would rebel against him and would do things that they wanted to do. Zeus was not all authoritative or all powerful, and the ancient Greek view of God was that God or their gods were very, very limited. And you know what? We can look at that today and kind of criticize them and say, oh, how could they have such a small view of God? But you know what? Many folks today have a similar view of God. Our God, in our minds, is as big as our minds can conceive. Whatever our minds can conceive Him to be, that's what He is, and no more. Well, of course, we as Christians know that our Bibles tell us something completely different about our God. As a matter of fact, as we look at our scripture today, the principle that we're going to see is that Jesus Christ is all authoritative. He is the almighty God. Open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 2 and verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter 2 and verses 1 through 12. Mark 2 verses 1 through 12. Let's go before the Lord in prayer before we read this scripture. Lord, We ask that you would speak to us now. God, we ask that you would open up our hearts and that you would open up our minds, that we would be able to receive all that you want to teach us from your word this morning. And God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts and minds to expand our view and our understanding of you, Lord God, so that we would be able to see that you truly are the all-authoritative, all-powerful, almighty one, Lord God. And help us, Lord, to live our lives in accordance with that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read the text. It says this, When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together, 
so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men. But, being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. But, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up. And immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone. So that they were all amazed and were glorifying God saying, We have never seen anything like this. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word for his name's sake. We see here in the 10th verse that Jesus says here that he basically has all the authority even to do the things that only God can do such as forgive sins. Why? Because he is God. Himself. This word that's translated authority in the Greek language has two parts to it. The first part means that one has the legal authority to do something. And the second part means that one has the power to carry out that legal authority. Some people have only the legal authority, but not the power to back up that legal authority. I'll give you an example. Back in 1949, the communists had taken over most of China and they forced the general Chiang Kai-shek, who had been the previous leader of China, they forced him to flee to an island called Taiwan. And they took over the whole mainland of China. Now, Shek, for several years after this, still liked to believe that he had the power to rule over all of China. And so, from his island of Taiwan, he would issue lots of these proclamations that were supposed to pertain to the whole entire country. And maybe, okay, you might say that he had the legal authority to do this. But he didn't have the power behind that legal authority. And so you 
you know what? His orders got ignored. Some people, on the other hand, they have the power to do things, but they don't have the legal authority to do them. We call those people rebels. Right? They have, maybe they have the power, maybe they've got a rebel army behind them, and they're stirring up their rebel army, and their rebel army is exercising power over people as they're, you know, taking over portions of a country and so on and so forth, but they don't have the legal authority behind that power. Hear the Lord Jesus Christ, listen to this. He has both the legal authority to do whatever he wants and the power to carry out whatever he wants. We see this spelled out a little bit more clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 15 through 17. And I want to read these verses to you because in these verses, or rather I should say it's Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, and verses 15 through 17, we see a kind of elaboration on both the legal authority that Christ has and the power that he has to carry out that legal authority. First, the legal authority, in verse 15 it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation in the Roman mind. When they said that somebody was the firstborn, that was a statement of the person's legal authority. The firstborn son in a family, when uh, he was taking over the family and the estate from his father, he was given the legal authority to rule over that family. In other words, the same authority that the Roman father once had, now the son also had. That was the legal concept in Roman law of the firstborn. And so what verse 15 in Colossians chapter 1 is saying is that the same legal authority that God the Father has, God the Son also has that authority. And then in verses 16 and 17, we see that he not only has that legal authority, but he also has the power to carry out that legal authority. As it says, for by him all things were created. Think about that. Think about the awesomeness Think about the bigness. Think about the all-inclusiveness of that power. Take your mind's eye back to the book of Genesis chapter 1, where it basically describes how God just spoke a word. And all these things came into existence. Remember that? God said, let there be light. And there was light. Mm -hmm. Look, think about that power. Just to speak a word. And it happens. And it comes into being. There is one who not only has the legal authority, being the king of kings and the lord of lords, being the lord of this universe, there is one who not only has that legal standing, but the absolute, all-inclusive power to carry out. As verse 16 goes on to say, both in the heavens 
and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or, or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Think about this. Our Lord Jesus Christ is so powerful, so much the Almighty God, that it's by His Word that this whole universe and every little thing in this universe is held together. If He withdraws that Word just for one split second, it all falls apart. That's almighty power. And so Jesus has both the legal authority and the power behind that legal authority. And here in Mark chapter 2, he is going to exercise both aspects of that word authority. He's going to exercise his legal right, his legal power, being that he is God, he has all the prerogatives, or all of the rights, you might say, of being God, and he's going to exercise one of them right here by proclaiming to this man, your sins are forgiven. And then, in order to back up that legal authority that he has, in order to demonstrate that legal authority, in order to confirm it to all who are there, he's also going to show the power that he has behind that authority by saying to that same man, here again, just speaking the word, get up! Take up your pallet and walk. And just as when he spoke way back in the days of creation and said, let there be life and there was life, here when he heals his paralytic man, all he does is say a word and immediately, you see that word immediately, the man gets up, takes up his pallet and walks just as instantaneously as that light had appeared back in the days of creation. And we are going to see now that in this text, in regard to Christ's authority, we have two groups of people and you and I are going to be forced to ask ourselves which group of people we resemble. The first group is a group that recognizes at least to some extent, maybe not fully, but at least to some extent the authority that Christ had. It's the four friends of the paralyzed man. Man, don't you wish you had friends like this guy's friends? The one thing I want you to see about them is that they had a determined kind of faith. They had an idea of who Jesus was, you see. They had an idea in their minds that he had the authority, the power to heal their friends. And they were not going to be turned back. No way, no how. They were going to find a way to get their buddy to the Lord Jesus Christ because they knew that it was only Jesus who can heal their friend. So they approached the door of the house. But the house is packed out. The scripture says even the doorway was crowded. Some Bible commentators believe that there were that this indicates that there were even people who were outside the door blocking the door. 
You know, most people would have been turned away at that point. Most folks would have said, okay, there's no way in. There's nothing that we could do. The house is all filled up. There's not an inch left of space in the house. There are even people blocking the doorway. We better just pack up and go home. But you know what the friends did? They looked around the outside. And they noticed, as was common with many Jewish houses of that day, there was an outside staircase that led up to the roof. You see, Israel is a hot place. And if you stayed inside your house, even at night, it could be stifling. If you had a number of people, it could just be, the heat could be oppressive even at night. So what a lot of folks would do is they had a staircase on the outside of the house that led up to the roof, and they would put a few chairs up on that roof, put a few cushions or something like that. Maybe at night, you know, when the air was a little bit cooler, they'd go up and they'd sit on that roof. Or maybe they'd go up there to get away from people, to get a little solitude in order to pray. The friends, however, they looked at that staircase. And instead of seeing a way to get away to solitude, you know what they saw? They saw a way to get to Jesus. And they carry their friend. He's on a, a pallet, what we might call today a stretcher. Think about this. They had to work to get that man to Jesus. That's the kind of determined faith that they had. They had to do something. They had to do a lot of something, really. You know what our problem is today? Too many times, we give up too easily. We don't get what we want right away, and so we throw our hands up. Oh, give up. We live in a fast... Okay, a lot of people might eat fast food. I call it a fast thing. We have a fast faith kind of mentality. We go to McDonald's, right? We order our Big Mac and boom, we get it right away. And we like things in the realm of faith to be just like that. We go before God, we, 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 we pray for something, we ask Him for something, and if we don't get it instantaneously, oh, we give up. We get discouraged. You know, let me tell you something. The uh, uh, old time saints used to talk about laboring in prayer. Remember that term? Laboring in prayer. We don't hear that term used much these days because we, we want to pray, but we really don't want to labor in prayer. Sometimes you've got to labor in prayer. Sometimes you've got to go to God repeatedly for something. Sometimes you've got to go to Him over and over and over. He wants to see if we really got that determined kind of thing like what these four friends had. And so they carry their friend up the staircase onto the roof and they have this achievement. I'd be still thinking, okay, we're up on the roof. What are we going to do now? <laughs> you know, they had this ingenious plan. I'd be thinking, you know what? You're talking about cutting a hole in the roof. There's the master down there. You know what? As, as, as we cut our hole in the roof, we're going to get a lot of dirt and garbage on it, and maybe we're going to offend him. Maybe we're going to maybe we're going to get him mad. You know, maybe instead of uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, attracting his mercy, we're going to attract his wrath. That's what I'd be thinking. But not these guys. They think it, that's the only way possible to get our buddy down to Christ. They cut a hole in the roof. And they lower him down. What kind? We have a weak faith that when we don't get what we want right away or what we need right away, we just 
just throw up our hands? Or do we have that kind of determined faith where when we know something is what God wants for us, that we hold on and we don't let go of God until we get that thing that He wants us to have. So the first group of people is a group of people with determined faith. And you look and you see, you know what they get? They get their answer. I know it, 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 it may seem like, you know, it's redundant almost to have to say that. They get their answer. They get what they came for because they had that kind of determination and perseverance in their faith. How many times are you and I not getting what God would have for us because we lack that kind of determination and we lack that kind of perseverance in our faith? Notice, though, that Jesus does something very interesting in the fifth verse. Jesus doesn't heal the man right away. But Jesus says something completely different. You see, Jesus is able to look past the immediate physical need and see the deeper spiritual need that this paralyzed man had. He had more than a need to just be physically healed. He had a more urgent, more important need, and that was to be spiritually healed, and Jesus speaks to that need first. And i got to tell you something. Our Jesus has guts. He has courage because he sees the scribes out there, which is the second group, and he knows the kind of reaction that he's going to get from them because he's all-knowing. He knows what kind of reaction, the hostility that he's going to get from them. And yet he speaks those words, anyhow, your sins are forgiven. You see, he has that authority. Being God, he has that authority to do that. He has the authority to forgive your sins and my sins today. And you know what? If you've got a physical problem, no matter how much that physical problem may trouble you, no matter how much a physical problem may trouble anybody, the spiritual problem matters much, much more. The Bible says again in the book of Mark, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world Gain everything that he needs and wants and what have you in the physical, but wind up losing his own soul. And Jesus recognizes this in the paralyzed man and speaks to that spiritual need and says, your sins are forgiven. But then that leads us to that second the first group had a determined kind of faith. The second group were completely hostile to faith. The second group of people are the enemies of faith. And guess what? Here's the real kicker. They're the religious folks. They're the folks that you would think of as being filled with faith. Or at least outwardly, that's how they like to come across to here it identifies them as the scribes. These are the people who would be the teachers of the law of Moses. The people who got up in synagogues and expounded the law of Moses to people. You would think that these would be people of faith, and yet they turn out to be the exact opposite. They're the enemies of faith. Because as soon as Jesus says, your sins are forgiven right away, they turn against Christ. They claim that he's blaspheming. Why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? I'll tell you, on that last front there in verse 7, the scribes actually got it right. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Here's their problem, though. They refuse to acknowledge 
that Jesus Christ, who was standing right in front of them, was actually God in the flesh. That they didn't want to deal with. And you know why they didn't want to deal with that? You know why they refused to acknowledge that? I think it's because they were jealous. They were envious. You see, if you read back in Mark chapter 1, two times when Jesus was speaking to crowds of people, it says there that the crowds found out that Jesus spoke as one with authority. And then it says there, not as the scribes. You see, they like to think that they were the ones who had the authority. They like to think that they were the ones who would get up and say, thus says the Lord. But see, here's the difference. When Jesus gets up to speak, He doesn't need to say, thus says the Lord. I get up to preach. I need to say, thus says the Lord. But when Jesus gets up to speak, He doesn't need to utter those words. You know why? Because He is the Lord. And that's why He was able to speak as one who had authority. Because He is the one who has all authority. And you see Jesus' reaction to these scribes. Which is it easier to say? In verse 9, your sins are forgiven. Or to say, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Well, the answer is, it's easier to say, get up, take up your pallet and walk. You see, even in the Old Testament, there were healings. Elijah raised up a dead son. Those healings, they were few and far between, but they did occur. And so if you had to choose between which was easier or more likely to happen, you would be forced to reckon, okay, yes, those healings were more likely to happen. And so the Pharisees or the scribes, when they see Jesus, if he just did the physical healing, they would say, okay, you know, he's got something special here, but, but we kind of seen that before. But here he speaks in verse 12, makes it clear. He said he speaks and he does something which they say we've never seen before. He speaks to somebody's spiritual need and he says your sins are forgiven. And then to back up, to back up the claim that he had the authority to forgive sins. Then he says to the man, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And immediately this man is instantaneously healed. And he did, said, look at this. He said, it says here in verse 12 that he went out in the sight of everyone. So you know what I'm picturing in my mind's eye? I'm picturing the scribes all gathered together in their... Uh, you know, with their haughty attitudes, looking down on the Lord Jesus Christ, trying to impugn Him and malign Him and so on and so forth. And heals, here's this formerly paralyzed man, and he struts away right in front of them, in full view of them, so that they could clearly see that the Lord Jesus Christ not only had the authority to heal folks, but also to cleanse them of their sin. And so, you know what? We are forced to ask ourselves a question here today. Which side are we on? Are we on the side of the friends who are full of faith, had a determined kind of faith, or are we on the side of the scribes who were the enemies of faith? Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Let's go before God in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, just thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for being the one with all the authority and all of the power and all of the might 
And yet, Lord, you know what astonishes us even more, Lord Jesus, is that you, as the all-powerful, all-authoritative, almighty one, still went to Calvary's cross and you submitted yourself to be punched and beat with a reed and spat upon, stripped naked, humiliated, whipped, and finally nailed to a cross, having a spear shoved up into your side such that water and blood gush out. Did that all for us to cleanse us, to forgive us of our sin, and to give us eternal life. Our hearts this morning, Lord Jesus, are just filled with gratitude. We cannot express our thanks and praise enough. Pray these things in Jesus' name.